Hi, this is Emerald and welcome to the Diamond Net and today I'm going to be talking to you about the ego in the Jungian psychological model. So what is the ego? Well, the ego is basically the center of consciousness. It's everything that we identify with our self-concept. So when we use the word I to describe ourselves, what we're actually referring to is the ego. In fact, I have even described the ego in the past as being a whole huge bundle of thoughts, beliefs, and ideas all centered around one single thought called I. Because of this, most people think of the ego as being the full extent of themselves, and anything that falls outside of the range of ego is deemed as other, and most of which is unconscious. But the fact of the matter is that the ego is just a very small segment of the internal landscape, and the internal landscape is just as vast and as infinite as the external landscape. Now it's important to realize that the ego is not a thing in and of itself. It's more of a conglomeration of different ideas, thoughts, and beliefs that are added to the self-concept over time that are always open to change. And for this reason, I think it's important to think of the ego as more of a verb than a noun, something that's done instead of something that is, because the ego is always being added to and always being taken away from. Now, as children, we have very simple ego structures, but as we become indoctrinated into our society and we start to learn our family's expectations for us, and we start to learn about our place in the world and what our preferences are and how we think everything works, more and more layers get added to that ego structure and eventually what we get is a fully formed adult ego. Now again, I want to stress to you all that the ego is not real in and of itself. So if we took that fully formed adult ego and we started to peel back the layers of thoughts and ideas and beliefs, eventually what we would end up with is nothing. So the ego is essentially an illusion, and it's an illusion that can be transcended. But the ego can be developed as well. In fact, Carl Jung actually favored this approach and recommended spending the first half of life developing a strong and healthy ego and then spending the latter half of life turning inward and looking toward deeper aspects of the psyche. He called this process individuation. Now in a moment I'm going to go over some common ego related issues, but first I want to really hammer out what the ego is not. So one thing that the ego is not is that it's not the persona. So the persona is another aspect of the Jungian psychological model and it really has to do with how we come off to others. So it's our social mask and it's how we can essentially fit into a particular social role within society. Now. Oftentimes our persona is related to our ego in many ways. There's a kind of congruence there. And so that's why many people could mix up the two. But the ego and the persona are very different. So the persona is external. It's how we come off to others. And the ego is internal. It's how we identify ourselves. So the persona is usually a really edited down version of the ego because there are aspects of our ego that we may not feel comfortable with other people seeing about us. Now another thing that the ego is not is the ego is not the full extent of the personal conscious. So in the Jungian model of the psyche, there are aspects of our psyche that we're conscious of and there are aspects of our psyche that we're unconscious of. So we have a personal consciousness, that's what we're conscious of, then we have a personal unconscious, and then we have a collective unconscious. So. Um, the ego is essentially the center of the personal consciousness. So we might have a tendency to think that the ego is the full extent of the personal consciousness, but there are many other things going on within the personal consciousness that don't directly have to do with ego. So for example, our wants and desires, they're self-referential, but they aren't necessarily an aspect of our ego because we don't necessarily identify um, with them. Also, the things that we know or our memories are part of our personal consciousness, but they're not necessarily an aspect of our ego. We kind of think about ourselves in relation to those things as opposed to being those things themselves. All right, so moving forward into the issues, there are really two main types of issues that I see with ego development. The first problem is weak ego. So this is where a person doesn't quite develop a strong enough or healthy enough ego to function in the adult world. So for those suffering weak ego, what happens is that most of the personal conscious is undifferentiated. So the person hasn't separated the wheat from the chaff in terms of what they identify with and what they don't identify with. All right, some issues that stem off of this main problem of weak ego would be number one, that a person has a hard time adapting in adult life. So 
being an adult is hard. You have to go through a lot of very difficult situations day by day. And you have to have an ego structure that's resilient enough to deal with those challenges and to be able to find positive emotions and positive ways to think about yourself. But a person with weak ego will have a very hard time finding positive things to think about themselves because they don't know themselves very well. And so they tend to gravitate more toward negative thoughts and negative feelings about themselves. Now another issue would be this sense of not really knowing yourself. So the self-concept sort of exists in like this haze where you're not really sure what you really identify with. You don't know what your identity is. You don't know what your preferences are. You don't know what your values are. You just kind of exist in this place where you're not really sure. Um, and this muddies the waters and creates a lot of indecision. And a person who is dealing with weak ego also has a lot of problems with making decisions because they don't really know what they want because they don't really know who they are. Now stemming off of this lack of clarity also comes the problem of lack of motivation and lack of ability to sort of build up momentum behind your sense of motivation. Because most people, um, their motivations come directly through their ego. You know, so they're thinking, even if they're not thinking about it consciously, deep down they're thinking, how is this serving me? How is this bringing me forward? And that's a very natural thing for the ego to do. And so if a person doesn't have a really clear sense of self, then it becomes very difficult for them to garner that uh, motivation of hope and bringing this one person forward. Also, many coping mechanisms happen within the ego. So if a person has a weak ego, they're going to have a lot harder time coping with the challenges of life. So coping mechanisms for somebody with a strong ego, those would be quite uh, strong and fortified and, you know, would allow them to have positive thoughts about themselves, even in negative situations. But a person with weak ego doesn't really have that luxury. Now for those of you who watch my channel regularly, you may be wondering because I talk a lot about ego transcendence, which I've experienced before, um, and you know, it is a very, very positive thing. That said, repressing the ego or having a weak ego doesn't bring you closer to ego transcendence. Ego transcendence comes whenever you recognize the ego for the illusion that it is. It doesn't come from making the ego weak. You want to have a strong ego to function through, and that'll actually help you create many positive habits so that if you happen to one day transcend the ego, you have a lot of good routines built up. And I'm always finding people who are trying to tear away at their ego and sort of strip it down to nothing and to try to not be a self. And what that ends up doing is it ends up repressing. Unless it comes from a really genuine place of self-inquiry and looking into the nature of reality, what's going to happen is that the person is just going to suppress the ego because they believe particular things about the way things work. So this would be ego repression, which is a really negative thing. So it's actually the exact opposite of ego transcendence because ego transcendence causes an expansion of consciousness, but ego repression causes a contraction in consciousness. Now I have a video on my channel titled Ego Transcendence versus Ego Repression if you want to check it out and I'll make sure that I put a card up above here. Um, but especially if somebody has the problem of weak ego, I highly recommend taking some time to develop a strong ego because you'll really notice a lot more potentials that you weren't before able to access and if you should want to transcend the ego in the future it'll give you more motivation to do so. Now the second major issue with ego development would be the unindividuated ego. So this is a person who has a highly developed adult ego but they think that they're only the ego. So they haven't really looked into deeper aspects of themselves and they really believe that the ego is the full extent of themselves. So this type of person is going to have the coping skills to make them feel okay about themselves where they can tell themselves a particular type of narrative and they can derive a sense of meaning from that and they can derive a sense of being okay as they are. But the problem is that they don't have any kind of deeper awareness about their shadow or their anima or animus or their higher self. And so there's just so much that's unconscious to them. And so some major issues with this would be, number one, lack of consciousness of one's own behaviors. So a person who has unindividuated ego might believe themselves to be the good guy of life and might believe other people to be the bad guy. And they would have certain narratives that sort of reinforce that. But the problem with that is it's often the people who think they're the good people that end up doing the worst things. 
Now, people with an unindividuated ego also have a tendency towards judgment. Um, because the strong ego has an ability to cope with certain realities in life much better than someone with a weak ego, you know, someone with a strong ego is going to notice that according to the general worldview, we're just a very, very small speck in this vastly infinite universe. But the ego needs to feel like it's the center of that. It needs to feel the most significant. So essentially what a person with an unindividuated ego will do is that they'll create a lot of arbitrary standards to judge themselves and others by. So they'll create some kind of thing that means, oh, if I'm doing this or I'm like this or if I'm smart like that or if I'm good with that, then that means I'm significant. And then necessarily, because the ego is competitive, you know, it has to differentiate itself from other people. So there have to be people that are less significant. So there's always this tendency of the strong, unindividuated ego to try to create narratives around why it is superior to other people. Now this tendency might be very overt, but it also might be very, very subtle. Like if a person has an idea that, oh, judgment is bad and judgment is wrong, they might not catch the judgments they're making because they would judge those judgments as wrong and they would relegate it to the shadow. So this is something that a person with any type of ego structure would really have to watch out for is judging other people as a basis for sort of bolstering up the self-concept. Now another issue of unindividuated ego that stems off of the last issue is megalomania. Now when I say megalomania, it might draw images of Hitler or some other dictator to mind. But megalomania is a very, very common emotion that almost everyone feels. Definitely everyone with an ego, especially those with a strong ego. So there's this sense that you are the center of the universe. There's a sense that what you are is somehow more special, more important than other people. Now someone with a weak ego might feel the opposite. They might feel like, oh, I'm the worst in the world. Oh, I'm so terrible. But again, there's still this centering of the self as the reference for all other things. So in a sense, that has a touch of megalomania as well. But you can notice this in yourself. So if you have an ego, watch out for megalomania. It's not just for Hitler and Stalin. Another problem with this type of ego structure is over-refinement of ego. So when I was a teenager, I wanted to be perceived in just a certain way, and I wanted to think about myself in just a particular way. And so anything that fell outside of the range of how I wanted to be perceived, I sort of just chopped that part of myself off and tried to forget about it because I wanted to come off in a very, very particular way. And so as I grew older, my judgments grew so much more. And so I kept sort of chopping away at myself. So if you imagine like I had a piece of clay right here and then I was just peeling back the layers of clay and what I ended up with was very, very small. And so that was my consciousness at that point because once you start chopping away aspects of your ego and repressing them, what happens is that you become less and less and less conscious. So you become like Wile E. Coyote trying to chop off the tree limb and ending up you know, chopping yourself down with it. Now an issue that stems from over-refinement of ego is a sense of disconnection from reality, so a lack of groundedness. I remember when I had that really, really refined ego structure, I remember walking around my freshman year of college and I was like, my goodness, I don't even feel like my feet are touching the floor right now because I didn't feel like I was really there. And I relate that to the fact that all of my focus and all of my energy was going to my headspace where I was essentially being the steward of this really, really complex ego structure. So I really didn't have the ability to focus on anything else. So at this point in the video, you may want to stop for a moment and sort of self-diagnose what kind of ego structure you believe yourself to have. So if you have a weak ego structure, what you're going to really want to be focused on is creating a stronger ego structure because that's going to make life so much easier for you and you're going to be able to cope so much better with the world. But if you already have a strong ego, then I recommend turning inward. So really looking to reintegrate things from the shadow, doing different inner work practices and the like. Now in a moment, I'm gonna go into how to create a strong ego, and then after that I'm going to talk about uh, the process of individuation and turning inward and how to do that. Uh, but when it comes to strong ego, it's a good idea to know exactly what constitutes a strong ego. 
So in my view, there are three main aspects to creating a strong ego. Now the first is that it's authentic, which means that it's derived from self-observation. So you're not just creating the ego out of thin air and making it whatever you'd like it to be. You're actually self-observing and you're seeing how you actually are. And this will help you get more clear about your identity, about your values, and about your preferences. Now another quality of a strong ego would be that it helps a person thrive within their society. So it's not just an adaptive mechanism, it helps you really sort of navigate the world in such a way that you can achieve whatever it is that you want to achieve. And you'll be able to derive the motivation needed to do so. And a third quality of a strong ego is that it's more expansive than it is contractive. Now, in a sense, some ego refinement has to happen. That'll help you sort of separate the wheat from the chaff in terms of what you identify with and what you don't identify with. But what you don't want to end up with is the over-refinement of ego. And so you want to make sure that you build an ego structure that's not based off of, you know, being judgmental and trying to cut away aspects of yourself. So you want to be able able to add as much to your ego structure as you possibly can while still being able to keep a clear sense of self. So here are some steps for creating a strong ego. Now before I go into those steps, I want to caution you to remember that the ego is only an illusion. So it's only your own thoughts and ideas being all bundled together. So make sure that you deal with the ego with a sense of detachment because it's not actually you, it's just your idea of you and what you identify with. So the first thing that you want to do when creating a strong ego is that you want to spend a lot of time with self-observation and you want to really hammer out what your preferences for things are. So if you're somebody who, like, if you get asked questions on a personality quiz that you can't really come up with a clear answer really fast, you might want to hammer out some things you know, within yourself, like, oh, what do I actually like in these situations? And just ask yourself lots of questions about what you prefer and what you don't prefer. All right, the second step is that once you find your preferences, then decide what your values are going to be. So it's important for a person who wants a strong ego to have a really clear set of principles and values for themselves to follow. And this will help give them a sense of meaning in life and a sense that they're doing the right thing by their own um, idea of themselves. Now, when you're solidifying your values, you want to make sure that you're giving yourself values that are going to serve you. So, for example, when I was a teenager and first building up my ego structure, hard work was one of my values that I chose for myself. And I'm very, very grateful to my younger self for doing that because I learned how to work hard and to persevere through uh, difficult tasks. And it served me very well in my adult life. But if I had created some different value of like YOLO or something like that, you know, who knows where I would have ended up with that. So you you can create positive values and negative values, so make sure that you're creating values that actually serve you. All right, step number three is to develop latent potentials. So if you come from a state of weak and underdeveloped ego, as you start to build up your ego structure, new potentials will arise, just like they do during teen years when most people are building up their ego structure. So if you're looking at your preferences and you realize that you have, let's say, a preference toward artistic endeavors, you may go on to discover that you have some raw talent toward artistic endeavors. You know, maybe, maybe not. And then once you know what you have a raw talent for, you can then develop that raw talent into a full-blown skill. So developing skills off of these latent potentials that can be used out in the real world is very, very important for this aspect of ego development. All right, step number four is to look at yourself very honestly and become aware of your genuine strengths and genuine weaknesses. Now this can be a little bit difficult for someone who is suffering from weak ego to look at their weaknesses because they might have a tendency to think very lowly of their self in the first place and so it might be a bit uncomfortable to look at these things even more. But if you take an honest assessment of yourself and you find out what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are, what you can do is you can leverage your strengths to your advantage and try to focus more on your strengths. And step number five is to get a really solid sense of what you're identifying with and what your ego is. This is going to help bring the ego out of that undifferentiated state and more into the center of consciousness. So that way you will know, like if somebody asks you questions about yourself, you should know it immediately. It shouldn't be like, oh, I'm not really sure, you know, I never really thought about that. 
you know, you want to really ask yourself lots of questions about yourself, like what your preferences are, what your values are, how you think about things, what your opinion is on things. So these types of things are very important to know if you're trying to get to know the ego. All right, so next I'm going to talk about some of the qualities of the individuated ego. So the individuated ego knows that it's not the center of the universe, and it knows that it's not the center of the psyche. And so it doesn't mind necessarily playing second fiddle to someone else, and it doesn't really have a lot of fears about insignificance. It's also geared toward introspection and integration. So it can look toward deeper layers of the psyche, like the shadow, and integrate from it. It can also have a direct connection to the anima or animus, or even a direct connection to the self with a capital S, which is really the God within us. So a person with an individuated ego tends to know their inner landscape quite well. And this is because they can look at it without blinders on. They don't have to see themselves as good all the time. They can notice that there are forces inside of them that are destructive and downright evil. So this is very, very important to be able to be aware of the deeper aspects of the self because there are things down there that don't paint us in the nicest light. And so if you're the type of person who has a strong ego and likes to think of themselves as a good person all the time and thinks that they don't have any flaws in this way, well, I would say that you're not really looking at the internal landscape deep enough. There's some really scary things in there, and that's just inherent to the internal landscape. All right, so here are some things that I recommend for the individuation process. Now, this is by no means an exhausted list, but I think that this is a good start. All right, so the first one is to do shadow work. So a lot of our unconsciousness comes from the fact that we want our ego to be just a particular way. And so we tend to cut away aspects of our ego as we get older and we relegate them to the shadow. And then there's also things all the way back from childhood down in our shadow and so many things that we're not aware of. So if we do shadow work, what we're essentially trying to do is we're trying to reintegrate aspects of ourself that we've left behind. All right, the second step is to practice brutal honesty. And I, when I say brutal honesty, I don't mean brutal honesty with other people. That doesn't matter that much. Now, be as honest as is nice to be, but when it comes to the self, you want to be brutally honest to a T. So if you're the type of person that likes to see yourself in a good light and likes to think of yourself as a good person, what you'll have to do is you'll have to suspend that and look down inside of yourself, and you can notice some pretty gnarly tendencies that you might have had a tendency to repress away. So brutal honesty takes a lot of detachment from ego to do. So it's very, very important in the individuation process. Now the second step is to be able to recognize and reverse judgment. So the first part of this step is to actually recognize judgment as you're doing it. Now a lot of people might have a tendency to think that they're not a judgmental person, but the ego sort of has a naturally way of judging people in subtle ways and saying, oh, it's like, well, I'm not judgmental because I don't say it out loud, but I just, I don't think that that person's behaving in the proper way, or I think that they're a little bit lame for doing this, or, you know, just very subtle things that you may not notice. And so brutal honesty will also help you recognize the judgments as they come up. Now it's important to mention that when you recognize those judgments, you may be tempted to try to suppress them because they paint you in a more negative delight that you probably don't want to be seen in. And so you want to make sure that you just let whatever judgmental thoughts come up and sort of hang back and observe them in a detached way. And then you can start to do the other part of the process, which is to reverse the judgment. So let's say that you're judging someone for being a trashy person. And deep down, what you're really judging is you're trying to protect yourself from seeming trashy yourself because you think it would mean that you're worth less than the average person or you're not worth as much as you thought you were. So it has a lot of ideas in there like worth and significance that you may not have even realized that you were trafficking in when you were judging someone. This will also help you be more empathetic to people who are different from you. All right, step number four is to integrate the anima and the animus. So the anima is essentially the inner woman in every man, and the animus is the inner man in every woman. 
So basically, this aspect of ourself is the mediator between the conscious and the unconscious mind. So if you're trying to get access to deeper layers of the psyche, it's very important to get in touch with your anima or animus. Now personally, I've suffered issues with both my anima and my animus, so I'm more inclined to believe that everyone has both. It's just that Maybe in the past, when Jung was conducting his research, it was more common for people to identify with one to the extreme exclusion of the other. So you may have an issue with one or both that you would have to remedy before you actually have access to those deeper insights and to the self with a capital S. All right, step number five is to do lots of contemplation and question everything. That includes everything about yourself and everything about your worldview. So what you'll notice is that you have a tendency to think that you know the way things go on in the world, but we actually know very little if we look at it. Everything could potentially be an illusion. So if I'm sitting in here in my bedroom right now, I don't actually know that my living room exists when I walk away from it. So there's so much that we have to take for granted as as human beings in order to really function in the world. Now, that's not to say that I'm trying to advocate debunking uh, basic fact-based beliefs, but just to suspend a little judgment, just to be a little bit more open-minded in your inquiries into the self and into the world. Now, you may have noticed that the main idea in all of these steps is to open things up in the psyche as much as possible. So a person with a strong ego or weak ego, they still are kind of stuck within that ego structure. That's all where they allow their awareness of themselves to go. But if they can look deeper at things, they can get a more expansive sense of self and get more access to the full depth and breadth of their internal landscape. Now many of these dovetail nicely with common practices of trying to get to enlightenment. So especially like contemplation or things like self-inquiry, being brutally honest with yourself, these things are recommended for that. But enlightenment work is really a topic for another video. But I'm just going to go ahead and leave you guys with this. So I think the most important piece of advice here is that if you're suffering from weak ego, make sure that you develop yourself a strong ego because it's going to make your life a lot easier. Anyway, that's all I have for now. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, go ahead, click the like button below and subscribe if you haven't already. Also, leave me a comment down below. I love hearing from you guys. Also, I want to say thank you so much to my patrons. You guys rock as usual. Um, and if you're interested in becoming one of my patrons in exchange for rewards, I'll leave a link down below in the description box. And anyway, that's all I have for now. And until next time, keep becoming more you. Mm -hmm.